race is on and Sergio Perez won the Monaco Grand Prix as early leader Charles Leclerc's home ground curse continued as he didn't even make the podium after starting from pole position. But was this a race Red Bull won or one that Ferrari lost? To answer that question and many more are Scott Mitchell and Mark Hughes. Well, good evening, Mark. Did you enjoy the good old-fashioned Sunday night wait for a post-race protest to be thrown out? Well, wonderful. I uh, particularly enjoyed the um, one-hour delay to get it started and then uh, the several hours at the end uh, to find out what the result was. Yeah, fantastic. <laughs> good race sounding, in between, though. <laughs> uh, exactly, yeah. You're sounding absolutely through. I did, I did say good evening to you, but it's actually good morning. Yeah. Uh, as we're into the small hours uh, in, in Monaco, for you and Scott anyway. I'm, I'm in the UK for, for this one. But, Scott, should we dispense with the, the general pleasantries and get this out of the way at the start? What was this unsuccessful Ferrari protest of both Red Bull drivers all about? Uh, yep. Hello, Ed. Um, so getting straight into it, basically um, Ferrari took issue with both of the Red Bull cars for uh, allegedly crossing the pit lane uh, exit line. We saw in the race an onboard of uh, Verstappen that did look like he went onto, onto the line, may have strayed over it, wasn't sure. Um Basically, once it all went to the stewards, Ferrari accepted that um, Perez didn't even uh, get onto the uh, onto the line, so they 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 were they accepted that that protest was thrown out, basically. But I think they'll be more aggrieved with the uh, the fact that Verstappen's um, Verstappen's trip onto the pit lane exit line hasn't resulted. Um, in a penalty Mattia Bonotto the Ferrari team boss suggested that they weren't actually trying to sort of attack Red Bull with this protest they weren't protesting Red Bull as such as seeking a clarification because it is a little bit unclear with some um, interpretation of uh, what exactly crossing the pit lane exit line means but basically the short version is the stewards said no there was a massive uh, bit, bit of a blunder from the race director who hadn't updated the event notes and just copy and pasted them from last year which meant the event notes didn't reflect a change in the FIA International Sporting Code which basically tweaked the definition of crossing the pit lane exit line therefore they found that Verstappen did nothing wrong and rejected the protest it's the uh, classic F1 tale of a ridiculously niche regulation being pursued um i suspect it was a little bit of a ferrari effort to try and um regain a bit of face shall we say after uh, blowing their their grand prix but um i'm gonna let mark get into that in a bit more detail yeah a classic line call you can be on the yellow line but you can't have your tire completely over it that seems to be the the key difference here but yeah well let's let's let mark get on with it and usually at this point we ask you to explain how the race was won but actually we're going to approach the question slightly differently as always we have questions from the race members club on our race review podcast so head to the race and click on join the race if you'd like to know more about the bonus content that you as a member could get chris parrot has the ideal opening question did ferrari blow a one-two or were red bull advantaged by being behind and able to react um, a little bit of each, but mainly Ferrari blowing it. It was um, the Ferrari lost this race twice: once with Leclerc at the first stops, and once with Sainz at the uh, the, the second one. Although um, it, the the Sainz one was um, really it, it, because of um, and being held up by Nicholas Latifi on on his outlap, so not really Ferrari's fault that one. But it, 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 that's when they lost a real chance of winning the race with Sainz, having already lost it with. Um, Leclerc. So yeah, they basically brought. They were too slow in responding to Perez's uh, very early first stop on the Inters on lap sixteen. They completely underestimated how much quicker the Inter was than the wet tire at this stage. And instead of responding immediately on the next lap, they waited a, another lap, and uh, that was just you know that, that that's what uh, lost Leclerc the race. That was lost them the position. And uh, Sainz had decided, um, and he was quite clear in um, ha- in his guiding the team that he didn't want to bother with the Inter. He wanted to just stay out. He was leading the race. He just wanted to stay out and wait until the track was dry enough to get straight on the slicks, thereby serving a pit stop. And um, so, because the Inter was so much quicker uh, than the, the wet at this stage. Um, it was quite close. It was quite a close call between whether it was quicker to do what science was doing, or do it the other way and get 
onto the Indus quickly and make up the use the extra performance of the Indus to buy the time of the extra stop. It was actually very close call, which was quicker in theory. Um, but yeah, so uh, look, science um, his wets were pretty much finished um, as he came in on lap twenty one, and um, so he was quite slow coming in. Uh, Leclerc on his fresher inters was catching him. Um, and Ferrari had figured that they could get them both stopped without on the same lap without um, Leclerc suffering a delay and then realised when it, by too late that actually Sainz's in lap was so much slower that they were going to have to stack Leclerc and thereby lose him a couple of seconds and that lost him a further place so bumped him down to fourth um, from a race in which um, really he should have won. So yeah, terrible, terrible day for Leclerc, and not not of his, his making. Um, difficult, frustrating day for Science, and uh, yeah, Ferrari left with um, a lot of questions to ask of itself. But this pressure was applied to them by Perez, and um, first of all by the early the early stop and how quick he was on those inters once he changed, and second of all by his. Um, in lap, the lap after signs was delayed by Latifi, and it was very, very fast in lap, and that overcut him into the lead. Yeah, unquestionably, very well executed by Perez. About four point three seconds, Leclerc took out of Sainz on that in lap that you reference, which shows how Ferrari got into that bit of trouble. But one thing that was interesting is, as you said, Ferrari were a bit too slow to respond. But I got the impression their plan was to respond with Sainz one lap, then Leclerc the next lap, and it it feels like. While they were disputing with Science whether or not to come in, they missed an opportunity to pull Leclerc in. I know you asked Mattia Bonotto after the race if that was a factor, and he said it wasn't. But it does seem that that, that was their whole thing. Almost the knock-on effect was that because Science took a bit of time, well, Science's pit wall took a bit of time to decide to go with his plan, that didn't let them bring Leclerc in on the lap where it would have mitigated the damage. So he just ended up on this horrible lap 18 stop that was just in between what you should do for switching to Inters or going straight to Slicks. Mm, exactly that, yeah. Yeah, he was in no man's land. Yeah, it was one of those uh, one of those awkward races. But yeah, you, you've got to feel sympathy though for, for Charles Leclerc, haven't you, Scott? Enough sympathy to qualify for Sympathy Corner this week? Oh, I think so. Um, I think it has to be a Charles Leclerc Sympathy Corner. It's his home race. He absolutely smashed it in qualifying. He did, he did all the hard work. Um, he did the difficult bit, really. Um, getting pole position it looked like it was uh, going to be nice and straightforward right up until about five minutes before the race um, almost as if Charles Leclerc's um, because this is this whole curse of his home race it just needed the national anthem to to really kick it into life and then as soon as the national anthem finished the heavens opened basically and that immediately sort of uh, cast a little bit of uh, you know, literal gloom over the event, but also a little bit of uh, metaphorical gloom in terms of Leclerc's process. You just got the feeling this was not going to be a straightforward race at all. So he has finally finished a car race in Monaco. And I say a car race because it's not just his Formula 1 record, it was also his Formula 2 record that was um, that was just... It was just bonkers how how bad his, his run of form has been in Monaco, not necessarily in terms of his own performance, but just all these things getting in the way, stopping him from finishing. So he has now got that finish to his name, and yet somehow it wasn't a podium, despite being in what looked like the fastest car, and he was the fastest driver all weekend. I didn't think anyone was ever going to come close to him. So to lose all of that through no fault of his own, it has to be sympathy corner. And a quick mention, Mark, for the pole lap that wasn't. Obviously, Leclerc did get pole with his first Q3 run, but that lap he was on, how special might that have been? I think he had to abort it to back when the red flags came out. He described it as um, it would have been the the, the the best lap of his his life, and um, it was four tenths up by the time he got to to back and the red the red flags came out as he was at to back. Um, yeah, I mean it was going to be a spectacular. Oh, yeah, let's assume that he he didn't do a repeat of last year and crash in the remainder of that lap. But um, had he completed it, yeah, it would have been pretty spectacular. And even though the red flag secured his pole, you could hear his frustration. He's saying, "Oh, I didn't get to finish the lap," because, you know, because it was just such a. It was clearly such a, a, a special thing for him, and um, 
yeah, it was spectacular. The car was oversteering and he was still gaining time everywhere. And uh, yeah, it was high risk, but um, truly, truly a special lap that wasn't. <laughs> It's a classic thing with Leclerc at Monaco, isn't he? He's really, really, really quick around those streets, but it just never quite goes for him. So, yeah, he had to settle for fourth place, which was, yeah, his best result in car racing by a long way there. And Carlos Sainz, of course, second place. Do you think, Mark, that without Latifi there, he would have been ahead? I think it would have been pretty close. It would have been close, but yes, it looks like it. Um, He lost, um, I think... Something like one one point six seconds um, with the incident itself, but as he said, it it, it took it, it dropped the tires out of the, the 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 temperature range and took him a while to get that back. Um, and you saw the you know Perez only just come out ahead of him, and it was less than a second, I would say. So yeah, I mean, look, just on the simple maths of it, it yeah, the the Latifi thing did cost him the the win. It's just that kind of season for Carlos Sainz, isn't it? Who ended up second place, his 10th podium finish without a win. I'm sure that win will be around the corner. But Scott, for all Ferrari's errors, it was a great weekend for Sergio Perez, wasn't it? He did look like the stronger Red Bull driver for most of the weekend, although he did crash on that final qualifying lap. But what a moment for him to win the Monaco Grand Prix. Yeah, it's um, it's, it's awesome for him. I, I'm really happy for him because... Uh, you can argue about whether or not it was right or wrong that he was able to take the start of the Grand Prix in, in third place, given it was his error that caused that red flag. It was, and that error did impact other people in, in qualifying. And in Monaco, you know, an error is just so much more likely to result in a red flag or a session destroying yellow or, or, or something that it just almost feels like it. Monaco is just the ultimate argument, isn't it, for F1 having an IndyCar style rule where if you do cause the red flag, you lose your lap time so so, so that you're punished rather than rewarded, basically, for having a shunt. Um, you can argue that either way. That was the only mistake he really made all weekend. From, from from the start of the weekend, he looked a lot more he looked a lot more comfortable than Verstappen in 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 the Red Bull, and it was just I think it was comfortably the most complete performance I've seen. From him, the most impressive performance we've seen from him in a Red Bull. Um, I can't remember a time where he's just looked this outright fast from from start to finish. And once he got into the lead, I, not just because it's Monaco, but just because of the quality of the quality of the rest of his weekend, I just did, I didn't really have any doubt that he'd lose it. It did look like maybe he was causing a bit of trouble for himself in the last few laps. There were a couple of times where I feel like he. There were a couple of laps into Mirabeau where it felt like he covered the inside when he didn't really need to. And then that meant Signs was really, really close then through the hairpin and then through Portier and then on through the tunnel and stuff. And, it, you know, it's just this like knock on where it's just you put yourself maybe under a bit more pressure than he needed to. But ultimately, he had a he had a Monaco Grand Prix win on the card. So don't blame him from doing everything he thought he needed to do to to secure it. It's It's got to be the biggest day of his uh, career outside of obviously all of his... Um, uh, family stuff I'm sure it'll, it'll be right up there with one of the biggest days uh, of his life so um, yeah all, all, all credit to him it's been coming as well We you, you can't say it's a massive surprise he's looked really good at times this year he's been building up a nice uh, nice little run of form um, he does look more compatible with the 2022 Red Bull it seems to suit him a lot better than last year's car as well um, and he put that to perfect use in this situation to produce a result that I really don't think anyone, anyone would have realistically bet on pre weekend. But I just think Perez in this 22 rule set and the way it's sort of the, the Red Bull in particular has certain characteristics, which probably Mark can explain better than I can. I don't think, I don't think it's very, what I think it's very easy to underestimate what Perez is capable of this season. Yeah. It's great to see him doing the job that, we all thought he could do coming into last year. It was quite painful at times seeing how it went last year, but he stayed on and he's doing really well. And all indications are he's going to stay on next year as well. But Mark, perhaps you could delve into a little bit why Verstappen wasn't quite on it this weekend. And is it connected to the the general trend we've seen this season in terms of the car behaviour that's also helped Perez perform better relative to him? Yeah, I mean, the Red Bulls um, understeer characteristic really is um what helps Perez relative to Verstappen because it's it's last year's Red Bull was um 
it, it rotated very, very quickly, very effectively, but it made the car feel unstable, which Verstappen was quite relaxed about. Um, but Checo wasn't, and now that that's been completely tamed by um, with with this car and the, the this season's tyres, um, and Checo is very comfortable with it, and it doesn't enable Max to get that extra um, advantage through, you know, um, really taking advantage of that very quick rotation of last year's car. Um, so it's it's not like it's not a false ceiling, but that that sort of idea. It, Perez is is definitely able to perform to a higher level with this car, but at Monaco that trait was exaggerated by um, the, the the Red Bull's reluctance to bring the front tire up to temperature quickly. So it needed uh, at least at least one prep lap in addition to the out lap, and ideally two. Um, and that, that was that was making life very difficult for for Stappen. And um, yeah, Checo was just um, more attuned to it and uh, generally looked to have the upper hand. And uh, but in the Q th- in the, the last runs of Q three, um, Max had worked out a sort of multiple run um, that looked like it was really going to work, and he was uh, already up on uh, Checo um, and looked like it was he was going to jump at least up to third and maybe even second uh, when um, Checo had the crash. So that was that. And so quite ironically, Perez's accident probably um, was a key foundation to him winning this Grand Prix because he put him, it, made, it ensured he was the lead Red Bull to take advantage of um, Ferrari's errors. That's the kind of curious thing that happens on the streets of Monaco, isn't it? But also Perez, you know, he's thinking of himself as a championship challenger and he's only 15 points behind championship leader Verstappen now. So he's in the hunt, but just great to see him getting a very, very richly deserved win. Scott, should we move on to Mercedes? George Russell was fifth, Lewis Hamilton eighth on a slightly more difficult weekend for the team compared to Barcelona. One of the more dramatic unseen moments of the race actually was Russell squeezing past Norris when the McLaren driver came out of the pits after switching to slicks to secure that position. Mike Meredith asks, how do you reflect on Hamilton's weekend given Russell beat him again? Um, I think it was um, I think it was another weekend in which the, the the end results don't reflect Hamilton's underlying performance in the weekend. But I do think I I I do think he could have avoided it by doing a better job on the first runs in, in, in Q three and the lap that he didn't get to finish because of the red flag in Q three probably wasn't going to get him ahead of Russell anyway. So even though he had actually been the faster Merck driver, I think, when it looked it looked like he was going to be when it counted, Russell then just got the edge on him in, in, in Q3. So he did a, Russell did a really good job there. Whereas Lewis, um yeah, Lewis just struggling a little bit with this trait that the Mercedes has. It is it's really not that that strong over over one lap. And Russell was talking about this after the race, where you can see the, the Mercedes is so clearly the third fastest car in race trim. But it it it's just it can get pipped by one or or two mid other midfield cars in in qualifying. It just doesn't have it quite right. And anyway, that that situation on Saturday obviously then laid the foundations for what we saw in the race because that's just what Monaco's like. So while Russell had a little bit more of an opportunity, and yeah, he was then able to engage in a good fight with with Norris and prevail there. Hamilton was just set on course for a very very frustrating afternoon, and it. There was a. It looked like there might be a brief opportunity for him to turn his race into something a little bit more dynamic, um, but that uh, that that basically came unstuck when he found himself behind a very um, very resolute Esteban Ocon. <laughs> Yeah, we'll probably get on to that incident when we chat about Ocon's progress uh, later on. One thing about qualifying I did notice is looking around the onboards, as I like to do after the session, Hamilton had a conversation with his engineer once he was back in the garage and the the radio feed was still on where he said that on that lap, he was in the wrong strap mode. I think he said he was in about 16 or something. He just, I got the impression he tried to change it and it hadn't quite worked. So I think that's what stymied his first Q3 lap, which is just an interesting little footnote. Mark, Mercedes, obviously it wasn't Barcelona form here. Do you put that down to some kind of full storm there or was this a very track-specific problem? 
Well, it's um, the, it, it's revealed uh, a different set of problems to the aerodynamic ones, um, which um, looked like they got on top of at Barcelona. And the bad news is that it the, the, this um, the circuit layout of Baku is probably going to bring that problem out again, and maybe Montreal as well. So it may be Silverstone before we see Barcelona type performance from Mercedes. I, th- I feel um, it's a, it's almost certainly linked, but the basically this mechanical problem is not is not something that's caught them unaware is it's something that they've been aware of since um, pre-season testing but it wasn't the number one priority the number one priority was the aerodynamic phenomenon um, and this has sort of taken a back seat to that so the new coming in um, that it, this wasn't going to be a great circuit for them um, but it's you know as, as Scott said it's clearly the third fastest car it's just um, Half a second. It was. I think George was within half a second of pole, but it is. A, it was a a very difficult half a second off, and uh, George did a mega high risk lap to to achieve it. And all credit to him for for doing that. And then that, that put him in position to, to to pull the result out of the bag. That it you know the fifth fifth was um, a, a good outcome. Monaco did offer a fantastic contrast for for for, for us to be able to see the the strengths and weaknesses of the the current Mercedes concept because uh Russell was Russell did a very good job of sort of running through this in in short form after the Grand Prix he just basically pointed out that they haven't really been that competitive in in the low speed corners but if you go to Barcelona if you look at Barcelona they were really quick in the high speed and down the straights and those are two characteristics that Monaco just just completely lacks so the the strengths that that Mercedes does have at the moment were irrelevant for for, for Monaco, and then the things that are weaker about the package, the the, the ride quality, um, the 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 overall load that the car produces, obviously, were just inherent weaknesses that they've seen before and therefore expected to have in Monaco again. But then there were extra things that were discovered on over the weekend, like with the the ride height that they had had to run at in Monaco maybe they'll have to run that in Baku for example as well or something like that the that window that the car is then set up in it that it doesn't produce enough downforce at that setting so it's it's like Mark said it is just it's this legacy effectively of them having to uh you know planning their car one way thinking it was going to really work not being able to run it like that what, and also having to troubleshoot, so not then improving on the inherent weaknesses of the launch car. So then you get into a position like this, where Monaco is probably like you know just a, a perfect storm in terms of factors coming together to to limit the Mercedes performance. So it'll be interesting to see what happens in Baku because if they do have this, if they do have the capacity to be quick down the straights when they run the car the way they want to, you know the the Merc could be dynamite in sector three. But if it's not switching the tyres on at the start of the lap and it's not producing a lot of load and good ride quality to be quick through low speed corners, it's going to have an absolute nightmare through most of sector one and sector two. So it could be a bit of a qualifying in Baku could be particularly tricky, I think. If you'd like to have a read on the Mercedes problems, there's a very good piece by the esteemed Gary Anderson what Monaco struggle reveals about Mercedes that's worth digging up on the race website. Should we talk about McLaren, Scott? Lando Norris just lost out to Russell. Russell went straight from uh, wets to hards and just managed to squeeze past Norris, who went via intermediate. So great performance from Norris, fifth on the grid, finish six. Superb. But there's a lot of talk about Daniel Ricciardo's McLaren future. He qualified 14th, finished 12th, seemed a bit confused by why the car wasn't working for him. So what is going on there? Yeah, it's a, it's a really difficult situation. Um, the, the worrying thing was just how many parallels this weekend had to last year, which was obviously the low point in Daniel's season. And Daniel was really, really struggling around Monaco last year on, on track, but also off it. You could see that that was where the sort of reality of his McLaren problem really set in. And it feels like any of the sort of early season optimism or, you know, the silver linings 
at the start of 2022, it kind of feels like they faded this weekend because Daniel looked kind of downbeat, sounded kind of downbeat. Um, the, the thing I have to give him credit for is how honest he's being. Like he isn't hiding from the fact that he's struggling. He's admitting that it, it, he's just not quite comfortable in the car and he's made a point of stressing it's not the team. Like he doesn't have a problem with the team. He feels like they're working really well together. It's just not working and coming together. So I get the impression that for one reason or another, I don't really haven't been able to get to the bottom of it yet, but hopefully we will in the coming weeks. It looks like some of the core characteristics of last year's car have, like they are still there in, in the 2022 car, even though the technical regulations are so different and the platform of the car could be seen to be very, very different. So we're seeing almost exactly the same problem as last year where just Daniel under under braking and in the corner entry phase just can't do what Norris can do. And it was just fascinating comparing their qualifying laps in Monaco. And you could just see such a consistent time loss at the minimum speed level where you can just see where Norris is... It, 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 it's clearly that he's, he, he's not having to um, brake as hard, basically, or as sharply as as Daniel is he can roll the speed into the corner a little bit more he's, a, he's more confident um the 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 most obvious example of that in qualifying was Daniel having to have basically a confidence downshift into into third through Massene and it and into um into Casino whereas Norris was able to hold it in fourth he didn't he wasn't worried that the front was going to wash out or the back was going to step out or anything like that and Norris can just crack on and it manifested itself in what was it like a seven tenth gap, seven te- seven tenths of a second in, in qualifying. It's, it's more than last year. You know, Daniel wasn't that far off last year, and it just feels like Monaco is like the worst place for it because even though it's a circuit he loves, because Monaco the corners come at you so quickly, there's no time for respite. I I don't think you can consciously drive a lap around Monaco, so if you're not naturally in tune with the car. I think you're going to be driving it wrong through the course of the lap. So no matter what progress Daniel has made and how much he's trying to drive the car the way it needs to be driven, I just don't think that works in in Monaco because I just think it's happening too automatically. And that style is clearly still not automatic to him. So I'm worried if it's not sunk in yet and if he hasn't been able to tune himself to it by now, like is he ever going to? And he he just seems so frustrated and downbeat after qualifying, and he sounded like someone who is starting to get very fed up with his situation. It, there there has been a lot of there have been a few hints now over the last week or so with comments from McLaren and slips from Daniel himself that it's not all set for next year. And I get the impression that, um, as I understand it, it's on Daniel's side to potentially end it early. He's got the contract to the end of twenty twenty three. But I think he's got a choice of whether he wants to continue for 2023. And honestly, the way he sounded this weekend and the performance this weekend, I, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not confident that that Daniel will be at McLaren next year because I don't see it improving like as much as it needs to for either party to be happy. And I just don't see why Daniel, being as competitive as he is, would want to go through this again. It's such a shame, but everything you talked about there is the problems that he's been battling with for the past 18 months. It just doesn't seem to be changing. Where do you see this going, Mark? Um, only one way. I think, I've said all along, I think it will be Daniel that calls time on this. And um, I think he, he will do. I think he'll call time on it a year early. And uh, I think that'll be it um, in terms of his F1 career. I think uh, he's, um, he's uh, really sort of come to the end of the road really and there's no there's no light at the end of the tunnel it, it's just it's just not happening yeah it'll be a real shame because he's such a great character he's done some great things in f1 but yeah sadly it's just not been happening and it's very difficult to see a turnaround well more on the monaco grand prix in a moment first let's talk grid rival grid rivals a fancy motorsport game and the race has its own league where you get the chance to beat scott and myself every week pretty reliably respectable 940 points for me for this one although i feel i was very unlucky with what i thought was my masterstroke i brought in pierre gasly and set him as my double points talent driver but his q1 disaster meant he couldn't get that top six that i thought was probably on the cards have i beaten you again scott what do you mean again? You've beaten me probably once this year. Um, 
You have beaten me this week, though. I will give you that. Your Gasly move wasn't quite as much of a masterstroke as you thought because I did exactly the same thing, funnily enough. Um, and, and it looked like it, it should have been a genius move. Um, but Alfa Tori, for some reason, decided that they wanted to completely sell, shoot themselves in the foot this weekend. So that, uh, unfortunately, screwed us over as well. So his fight back in the Grand Prix was welcome but it wasn't quite enough. Um, unfortunately, I also paid the price for having um, Leclerc in the team. Obviously, he lost points because of his um, lower finish in in the race compared to what it should have been. And I also had Mick... I, I, I've, been, um, I've been limping along with Mick Schumacher as my budget driver for quite a few races now. And, and, and he's just... He's... I've, I feel bad. He's, he's hemorrhaging team value for me at the moment. So I actually feel exactly the way Haas probably feel about him at the moment. He's just costing me a load of money. Um, but, but then, you know, I had decent enough returns from like Valtteri Bottas, Sebastian Vettel and McLaren. So it was an okay week. It was just, you know, a couple of decisions. It could have, you know, they, were, they weren't even 50-50s. They should have worked quite well, but they didn't. So I still suck at this game. <laughs> I was quite pleased with my pick of Alpine for this one. Both got reasonable finishes, although Ocon not quite as good as it, it should have been. But yeah, not a bad week. Leading the league overall and doing much, much better than us is Maniscald 24 with a team of Sainz, Alonso, Hamilton, Leclerc, Verstappen and Haas. Well done to you there, despite Haas letting the side down somewhat. This week, Grid Rival's still open for sign-ups. We'll be tracking progress over the year, so download the Grid Rival app or visit the website so you can get involved. The link is in the episode description for this podcast. Mark, mention of Alpine there. They did have a decent weekend. Both cars were in Q3. Fernando Alonso started and finished seventh. And Ocon ended up 12th, but he was ninth on the road, wasn't he? He lost that result to a five-second penalty for the the collision with Hamilton. Alonso did seem to be going very slowly after the red flag restart. What what was going on with his race? (laughs) Um, I think um, it it was an exaggerated version of getting the, the... That making sure that the medium tyres would last to the end. Um, they had asked him to um, just make sure he kept Hamilton behind him and um, didn't worry about uh, making any further progress from there. And uh, he he took that to heart and uh, was lapping so slowly that um, he, he had a basically a queue that comprised the rest of the grid, even though it was quite a, a long way up it. And then all of a sudden produced a lap that was about four seconds faster and just left Hamilton behind. So, yeah, whether he was trying to back Hamilton up into Ocon or whether he's just having a little bit of fun, I I don't know. But, um, yeah, it did seem like a a very sort of uh, exaggerated um, uh, set of actions from... uh, Because he, you know... the. Yes, he, he he did get the tyres to last well, um, but um, I don't think he needed to go quite that slow to, to do that. He did Lando Norris a bit of a favour because it allowed him to make a pit stop, take some fresh rubber and get the fastest lap for the bonus points. So helping out his old team, McLaren there. Scott, Ocon's penalty was for that collision with Hamilton. What did you make of that incident? Oh, I did think Ocon was to blame, but... I don't know if I thought. I don't know if I think that a time penalty was necessary for it. I, it did ultimately compromise Hamilton's race, and I, I thought that Hamilton was far enough alongside that he did deserve to be given a little bit more space. But um, yeah, it was a bit difficult. I, I definitely, definitely thought at the time. I think I messaged you at the time and said, oh, "I think Ocon probably did a bit. It was a bit much there. He 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 probably should have yielded a little bit, but." I don't know. I I think like when I think there has to be a little bit of give and take, especially when you're on a track like Monaco. Um, I'm always very wary of suggesting that you know we have special rules for certain tracks or circumstances or corner configurations or anything like that. But that is kind of just the reality of how things work. If you're gonna, if we're gonna have to watch this quite tedious race sometimes and put the drivers and cars in a situation where they're never able to actually fight one another then I think there has to be a little bit of give and take that when the car is under attack and uh, th- there is a bit of battle and it is going to be really, really hard because track position is just is 99.999% of the job in, in, in Monaco. But yeah, I don't know, five seconds, it, it did feel a little bit harsh because of the impact it then had on Ocon's race because obviously uh, by that point, Hamilton w- w- was ahead of him anyway. But pff, ultimately, I did feel he was to blame. So... I'm not going to 
challenge the penalty too much. I just wouldn't have been that bothered if it, if it didn't end up in a five-second penalty, if you see what I mean. Yeah, I'd be inclined to agree with you on that one, which doesn't make for good argumentative podcasting. Ninth in the race was Valtteri Bottas. Slight disappointing that Alfa Romeo one's a bit stronger Mark they were slightly held back by the fact he had that problem in UK wasn't it in Friday practice but just the ride of that car didn't seem to let it be quicker uh, at Monaco yeah it, it did and um, it it wasn't happy on the bumps at all and um, I think it was cer- certainly in the, the really slow stuff um, like down at Mirabeau um, it looked a little bit like the Williams in that it rarely had um, both both front wheels on the ground. Um, it, it, you know, it's, you, you quite often see cars three wheeling there, but it, sometimes it was actually two wheeling, and it um, just yeah, it just didn't look compliant enough for the for the what's a very bumpy circuit. Yeah, I was speaking to Chevy Pujolar, the head of trackside engineering, after the race, and he said that they realised kind of too late what they could have done to counteract that and if they'd had their time again they could have improved things somewhat but still solid to pick out two points from a weekend that could have been uh, could have been a little bit of a bust for them given especially given the uh, high expectations they had coming into it and Sebastian Vettel's got 10th place he went a bit earlier on intermediates considering his position didn't he? Yes um, but I, I still think this was um, this was a nice and encouraging weekend for him and 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 the team, the car looked in a lot happier place than it did when this um, launch spec revised car made its debut in Spain. Just a little bit happier from start to finish, and obviously we heard uh, Lance Stroll's uh, shriek of anger and disappointment in qualifying because he knew that he'd blown a decent chance. The potential was there in in, in the package. Um, Vettel is Vettel's impressing me um, as the season sort of picked up, kicked on. I know obviously the first couple of races he wasn't there for Australia was just an absolute nightmare, but he's, he's put together a couple of really good drives since then. Imola, obviously I feel like he was bang in position to absolutely make the most of Aston's opportunity there. He was doing a good job in Miami as well. Feisty drive, a couple of really nice moves in that race, obviously ended in disaster with his contact with Mick. Um, and here again, just, you know, piecing it together when, Stroll obviously didn't getting into a position to even if it's only scoring a point, whatever you know, get into Q three. It just feels like Seb's just starting to pick up a little bit. I actually feel like he's doing a better job at Aston this year relative to Stroll than he was last year. So that's quite nice to see. I know ultimately he's not in F one to grab a solitary point or anything like that, but it, it still seems to be decent step on from what we saw a few weeks ago when I was starting to wonder whether or not Seb had the motivation to to continue yeah he, but he does very much look like a driver who's up for it at the moment yeah the the memories of Australia when he came back after his after missing the first couple of races to to COVID starting to wonder if he just didn't fancy it but yeah it's gone it's gone pretty well since then you'd have to say you mentioned Stroll there but it, it was a difficult time for Canada wasn't it what was effectively the first lap of the race under the under the safety car with both Lance Stroll and Nicholas Latifi finding the wall while uh well supposedly going around slowly but it shows just how tricky these cars are in these conditions without much tyre temperature Mark Pierre Gazzi and Alfa Tauri were really strong this weekend, only 11th because Gazzi was well down the grid. So what went so badly wrong for them? And do you think I'm being a little bit over-optimistic to feel that, that Gasly maybe could have been on, even on the third row if he'd had a, a fair crack at qualifying? No, I think that's perfectly realistic. He was so close um, to getting across the line. It was just, <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen it. Um, someone you know, miss it by such a, a this tiny margin. He, he didn't even. He didn't even know. He 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 cracked on, and he and I think he asked the question when he was going up the hill because he thought well, it was close. And they said no, sorry, yeah. not not made it. Yeah, so that put him out in Q one. But um, you know, throughout the practices, he'd been, you know, fifth, sixth. He was. Uh, yeah, he, you would, you would have expected him to have, um, to certainly it's a sort of Lando Norris, um, George Russell sort of part of the grid. Uh, on, on on purely on merit, so yeah, it, it just a real real shame, real real because it's, I think that this sort of cir- slow corner circuit, it, it it is quite good at, and so they've sort of ended up having sort of really wasting what should have been one of their good good weekends. 
yeah, and Sonoda, of course, had a had a pretty difficult time in in that race as well. Uh, obviously, wasn't uh, wasn't ultimately a, a points threat. So yeah, you feel a bit of sympathy for AlphaTauri. It's just a season that's been very very stuttering for them, sadly. Well, Scott, it's another bad day for Haas. Neither driver finished. Magnussen dropped out with a power unit related problem, but Schumacher crashed out at swimming pool. What do we know about the cause of that shunt and the implications of it as well? So in terms of the cause, it looks like it's Mick just positioning the car slightly slightly wrongly. So he suspected he was just a few centimetres basically off offline. And obviously it was at a point in the race where the racing line was dry, but off off offline was still wet and it just he, he said it was just like really weird the way it happened and it, and it did look it you, know, you look at it from the onboard it snapped so quickly from the outside it looked quite dramatic I think the end result in terms of the damage of the car made it look a little bit more spectacular than it was because actually the initial impact was obviously high speed but did relatively little damage but then it's the second impact that then causes the back of the car to to, to, to break off and there were a few people that were surprised by this and sort of thought, thought it made it really violent but that correct me if I'm wrong but that is that's the, the cars are designed to do that now aren't they is it one what isn't it one of the legacies of the the, the the Grosjean crash in 2020 the idea that the car is meant to break away a lot easier am I talking nonsense or is this correct no no that's that's right it's right they, they reduced the loads at which it which should break off so that the um, loads aren't uh, transferred through the driver. Yeah, exactly. So that was a bit of a. It's a bit misleading. It makes it look like it looks. It makes it look like Mix had an absolute monster shunt. It was. It was. I think quite a big one, but not. Not maybe not as dramatic as the end product made it seem. Nonetheless, load of damage for Haas. So the implications. I think there are two. One is the financial implications on Haas. Gunther Steiner is made no secret of how unhappy he has been with the crash damage that has been picked up on Mick's side, it has to be said, so far this season. And it's probably actually not far off the damage they were picking up when they had two rookies in the car last year. And Haas can't afford that. It, anything out of the budget cap is money that you can't spend developing the car because you're repairing it and buy and you know building new replacement parts. Um, but the second implication is... This is it's, it's, it's bad for Mick's prospects just in terms of his career and momentum because there was a line in the Haas press release, obviously, like Gunter Steiner being openly critical of Mick and basically saying he's very disappointed, this can't happen. And there was a phrase he used where he said something like that, we have to see what we do moving forward. And I wondered if that sort of came across a bit more harsh in black and white than... Maybe it was intended. Maybe it was intended to be a bit more of a how we got to work out just how we make him more comfortable and stop crashing going forward. But it read a little bit like we're going to have to work out what we want to do with this guy going forward. I, I can't really see why at the moment there's not really an argument for keeping Mick on from a competitive point of view for next year. He's he's not quite on Kevin's level on one lap pace, even though he he, he can do it from time to time. And he's just not threading together the 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 the, the weekends and especially the race days. And he's also crashing a lot, which is which is just really bad. And I, it's hard to see where else he would go. Like who 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 would pick him up? So I really hope Mick turns a corner because there are glimpses of potential there of the driver he he can be. And he's a very nice guy. He's a good person to have around in, in Formula One. I don't care about having that surname. In, on, on the grid he's a, he's a Formula 2 champion who works hard and is a very pleasant person so it'd be nice to see him deliver on his potential but at the moment he is still he's he's still for, he, he's definitely falling short of what he's capable of he's making himself look worse as a driver at the moment than he is yeah, you get the feeling he just needs that one decent straightforward weekend and to bank a few points just to get himself onto an even keel but I've been saying that for a, a while now so yeah frustrating for him and very frustrating for Haas now most of our race members club questions related to a couple of topics, one of which was what went on at the start of the race. I'm going to read through a few of them and then perhaps what we can get 
into what happened in in detail. Danny Elliott asked any thoughts on the race start procedure from today's race. Martin Brundle said on the Sky TV feed, we've learned nothing from Spa last year. Quite appropriate for the FIA. The whole start procedure and handling the race just frustrates me in the indecisive nature of the FIA. Dan from Walthamstow says, why are race directors so overcautious about starting? In the wet, Michael Amherst said, when will F1 sort out its race direction? I have friends who do not usually follow F1 messaging me utterly confused as to why the race was not underway. Sander Van Hulten said, given how long the race start was postponed and at some points it was barely raining at all, were the race directors mistaken the Monaco Grand Prix for the Indy 500? Surely F1 cars must be capable of driving in a bit of rain. And Tom Benstead said, when do we admit the grass isn't always greener with regards to race direction? Monaco Grand Prix was full of odd decisions from delaying the start to dishing out penalties when they weren't really necessary. Brackets thinking of Alex Albon's sympathy corner here. Alex Albon, he did get a penalty, of course. I'm not convinced this would have been such a mess had Massey not been in charge of race direction. So, Scott, can you explain the reason for the delays? Firstly, the delay of the initial start and why it took so long to get the race going after the stoppage for rain and why it was a rolling start. And are you on the bring back Michael Massey train? <laughs> oh, I've got no idea how to answer that question diplomatically. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not just purely because um, I, I think the problems at the FIA and with their management of Grand Prix weekends and a lot of things about them are deeper than one individual I feel like Michael Massey was um, a symptom of a much deeper set of flaws within the organization but within that there were also personality traits there that I don't think were particularly um, particularly good for, for Formula One I never really got a sense from him that he was willing to admit he was wrong even though he would then often change things for the following race and it just didn't really feel like a particularly collaborative or um self-critical organization but anyway not it's not about him the problem is i think we still see signs of that within the fia which is why i think sort of massive was as much a product of his environment as it was his own maybe flaws in in that position um i i have an element of sympathy with race control uh for this one because i understand ev- pretty much every view that was expressed there by the by the listeners um and the members um i do understand because they weren't being relayed in useful information because for some reason it wasn't being shared. And I don't really know why it wasn't being shared, but basically we know that obviously the rain came literally minutes before the start and it, and it just caused chaos as teams had to scramble to switch to suitable tires. And there seemed to be a weird bit of, um, a weird bit of control from the FIA at this point, because they seemed to make it mandatory to have full wet tires for the race start for safety reasons, because there'd not been any pre previous wet running this weekend. And it seemed like the t- they had to delay the start so that the teams could get prepared for that and also because they were monitoring this big downpour that was coming near to the circuit. Um, but then eventually we ended up triggering a much, much longer delay, which was why the race only began was over an hour after or an hour after the, the, the scheduled time. Despite the rain easing and the FIA's weather radar at one point even said no major downpour approaching and like the rain had changed to just like drops or something like this. It, it seemed crazy. Um, I think the FIA were just playing it safe in the first instance. I don't really think they did a massive amount wrong there. It, that it, you can, It's sort of 50-50. I, I don't have a massive problem either way. But that initial downpour the heavy rain caused a a, a sort of localized power cut in, in Monaco, which affected the, um, the start control systems. So I don't know why this wasn't being relayed to people, because if we'd known that everyone would have been pretty relaxed. It just seemed like they weren't doing anything, but they basically took time for them to repair this. And then while they were getting everything back in place, what they couldn't do was get the starting lights to work reliably which is why we then had rolling starts. Obviously, a rolling start when the race did begin properly in wet conditions probably would have happened anyway. I wouldn't have been surprised if it had happened that way. But then later when we had the red flag and then the restart in dry conditions, we still had a rolling start and that was because the start lights couldn't be used again. There was also a suggestion from the FIA that they factored in the fact that because the track was dry in different places, there would be patches on the grid that were would have different grip levels and it might be unfair. So a rolling start was just 
the best way of, of of doing it. So I think my basic point there is there were other factors at play. I wouldn't um, come down on the FIA like a ton of bricks on on this, even though from the outside, I totally understand why people are super frustrated with it. But even within that, I think there were some some odd decisions being made. I don't, I still don't really understand the whole thing at the the first start why we didn't just crack on with it with full wets and then or let the teams do what they want to do and then red flag it once the the big downpour came. That that would have been an option. We'd have got the race started, but yeah, it's 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 just a shame that we still have a race control system within Formula One that it's so easy to pick holes in. Yeah, it would help if the communication was better. I've suggested they have some kind of FIA media person who's just embedded in race controlling who can feed updates to the wider world and to the broadcast to make it very, very clear because sometimes the stuff is is very, very logical. The other big talking point we got questions about was the future of the Monaco Grand Prix itself. Understandably so, given this is the last year of its current contract. So a batch of questions about this. Tom Benstead said, will the fact that this race was so eventful and exciting help Monaco's bid to stay on the F1 calendar? Mike Meredith said, there's been some grumbling that the Monaco Grand Prix doesn't belong on the modern F1 calendar. Do you think this race proves that it still belongs there? Chris Parrott says, will the ACM, that's the Automobile Club of Monaco, be happy or not with the 22 Monaco Grand Prix in the context of ongoing negotiations. Danny Elliott says time for the Monaco Grand Prix to go now. The cars cannot overtake under normal conditions and I was all for it a few weeks ago but after today's FIA conundrum I'm against F1 continuing this race. So Mark lots to get into there but do you think what happened in the race today made any difference to the future of the Monaco Grand Prix and what is that future currently as you can best make it out? I think it was a generally positive outcome. Um, the, the, I think if we'd had a, a very dull, boring race, um, it would have just fed into the um, the, the, the difficulty of uh, the negotiations. Um, at least this, um, you know, m- m- made a case for itself. But um, I think um, the, 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 those negotiations are a, v- a very, very difficult point. Um, we understand that. The, the circuit is it, it, it's gonna get uniquely gets its um it, it gets the advertising revenue for the, the signage around the, the circuit it has the rights to that um other other circuits don't um formula one has those rights and it's um signed a an extension um with a a sponsor that clashes with one of f one sponsors and it, it just you know um doesn't seem amenable to the, the the sort of updates and changes Liberty would like to make, and there's a there's a level of frustration there from Liberty. Um, not not so much in the anything being intrinsically wrong with it, but just in the the lack of flexibility in the attitude that, that that's been shown. And um, as things stand at the moment, it um, there is no significant prospect of a, a new contract being signed but that's not to say that you know ne- negotiations won't sort of find a way through all that the, maybe they will maybe, maybe they won't but I wouldn't t- take it as a given yeah it seems to be that it's going to be down to Monaco to making a few compromises I think Toto Wolf put it quite well he said Monaco has to embrace the new realities of what the sport stands for today so I think that's uh, that's a clear sign he wants to see a little bit of compromise on the ACM side so we'll see how that goes and yeah it could be that we end up with a Monaco Grand Prix every two years or a very short-term new contract all sorts of possibilities to keep an eye on there well thanks Scott Mitchell and Mark Hughes for your insight head to the race.com and don't forget the hyphen as there's loads to read there Mark Hughes race analysis my driver ratings will be there on Monday at some point also Scott Mitchell will be working through all sorts of reaction from Ferrari Mercedes Red Bull lots to talk about and also Gary Anderson's insight check out our sister podcast including the race IndyCar our podcast indy 500 of course this weekend and also have a look at our youtube channel just search for the race loads to watch there we've got a two-week break now but stay with us on the race f1 podcast for everything you need to know from the world of f1 (laughs) 